All right, so we are studying Teshuvah from the writings of uh, Peretz. Last week we spoke about the Yetzirah and then seven different names. Mm. This week we're going to speak about something a little different. I started writing a little book, Teshuvah, and... This led me to this chapter, and this chapter led me to, in the last 24 hours, about 23 different books that echo the same idea. Mm. And that is the following. We make a blessing in the Siddur, and Barry, do you have a Siddur in arm's reach? Does that have Amida inside of it? Oh, yeah, perfect. Hashivenu avinu latoratecha. Return us, our Father, to your Torah. Vekarvenu malkenu avodatecha, and bring us close, our King, to your service. Vachazirenu bitshuva shlemal fanecha, and return us in complete tshuva to you. Now, obviously, different siddurim will have a slightly different nosach, but we all agree on one text. It's Baruch Ata Hashem. What's the blessing we make? Blessed are you, Hashem, who desires our teshuvah. Hashem wants our teshuvah. It's not such a simple statement. We want to do teshuvah. That would be a true statement. Blessed are you, Hashem, who accepts our teshuvah. That's what it should have said. Blessed are you, Hashem, who hears, our, who helps us in our teshuvah. But Hashem wants our teshuvah. This is an interesting... It's an interesting wording here. And this is the Yisod. This is a fundamental aspect of Teshuvah, which is that Hashem wants us to come close to Him. Sometimes when people speak on matters of Teshuvah, they like to be sharp and strict and harsh and, and they'll say, we don't want to sugarcoat anything. It's just the truth. The Ma said, that's not true. What do you mean you don't want to sugarcoat anything? I mean, half of, if not half, maybe more than half, of getting something to happen, of presenting an idea is the way you present it, the style in which you present it. Two people can say the same thing, and one of them is said correctly, one of them is said incorrectly, and then what did you accomplish? Chachamim ma'ilu betakanatam. Chachamim get decree, but what does it help them? And that's why our rabbis tell us, divrei chachamim benachad nishmei. The words of our chachamim are always heard they're always accepted when they're done in nachat, in kindness, in, in pleasantness. Nobody wants to be screamed at. Nobody wants a finger wagged at them. Nobody wants to be told how many times they're going to go to Gehenom and how many Gilgulim they're going to come back. And nobody, want, nobody wants to know. And when you see that people don't want to know something, you don't tell them the things they don't want to know. Ah, so we're the ones hiding Judaism. Chachamim already said, just like a person has an obligation to say the things that will be accepted by other people, so too there's a mitzvah to not say the things that are not nishma, that are not accepted. You have to know who you're speaking with. You slowly can open up. Of course, there'll come a time when they'll accept everything. But you slowly, a chacham has to know. What is a chacham? He has to be wise. He has to use his brain. He has to use his dad. Not, you can't throw a book at somebody. You know, we make fun of the, the Bible thumpers. You know, this is the, they, they thump you on the head with the Bible. <laughs> I, I'm misled, we've made our own version of Bible thumpers. And it's not a new thing. You think it's, uh, it's the last generation. You have a few. So it goes back. I have a letter here from Rav Kook. This letter is found in Igrot Haraya. The letters of Rav Kook. It was written to Rabbi Chaim Elazar HaKohen Bechovsky. I don't know, Bechovsky, I don't know how to pronounce the last name. This, this rabbi had asked Harav Kuk, who was the chief rabbi of Israel, to join him in a protest, in tshuva, to give you the, the stop, or whatever it was, chilu shabbat, a secular jika, whatever it was that he was fighting against. So Rav Kuk writes to him, Mikhtavo hayakal, your precious letter, hakatuv belibat esh, nikudat lev Yisrael apinimit, which was written with the fire of the, 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 the internal Jews, neshama, Higiani, I got your precious letter. Even after I'm willing to meet, to be a friend of Hashem, to all the Shavuot, 
even though my normal attitude is that whenever religious people that are fearers of Hashem want to do something, I will always be the first to join them. To strengthen the Holy Torah, especially here in the land of Israel. In any case, I find myself required to awaken your hearts. You're doing holy work. You have to use your brain, your intellect, your dad, in the things that you're about to do. Our rabbis have a famous teaching where they tell us in Brachot that great is Hashem, uh, that that Hashem gave us, the intellect that Hashem gave us, because it was given between two letters. What does that mean? It says in Shmuel, Ki'el de'ot Adonai, that Hashem is a God of Da'at. So you see that it's put in between the word El, and between the word Adonai, and therefore Da'at is a very holy concept. It's given between two names of Hashem. Not everything you do that is right comes with Da'at. Imagine you have to raise your children. Of course you want them to do all the things right all the time. The truth is they're not going to. Every child in the world has his own style, his own attitude, his own personality, his own yetzah. Everyone in the world has his own thing. And you as a parent, you have to know which wars, which battles. Sometimes you lose certain battles because you want to win a war. That's every good general knows this rule. You don't have to win every battle. You just have to win the war. Sometimes if you insist on winning every battle, you'll get low on soldiers, you'll get low on food, you'll get low on provisions, all kinds of things. And then you lost the war. So what did you gain? Every person has to know. Remember we said last week, our parents said, you have to know which fights to fight with the Yetzirah. Which ones to give in to the Yetzirah. Which ones? You have to know these things. When you raise a child, sometimes you want to fight with them about everything. But you have to pick what are the important things. The other ones will come along. But if you fight about everything, so when it comes time to fight about something important, you know, once uh, uh, my wife's uh, father told her, you know, this time I'm going to have to tell you no. I said, why? Because I always tell you yes, so now I have to tell you no. I thought we couldn't have let him say no a few times before, that now he has to say no. But he's right. Sometimes you have to know which, which uh, he always tells you yes, yes, yes. When it's important to him, he says no. This is an important rule. This is an important message to have. Not everything you have to... For my father, my first book he gave me to go to Yeshiva was a book called Chovat Talmidim by Rabbi Klonimus Kalman Shapira. He was the Rebbe of Pia Setna. My father bought me this gift. And he wrote inside, both my parents, they, they wrote inside, pick your fights wisely. I guess I was already fighting with people then. And they told me, you're going to go to Shiva, you have to know what, what do you really want to win? You want to win everything? You're not going to win everything. So make a point, win strategically. Same thing says on Fukuk, you need that. He says, Rav Kook continues, the, the, the decline of our generation it's not because the rabbis didn't go protest outside of the houses of the heretics. That's not why this generation has been declined. This is Rav Kook. These are the same heretics that ruin our land, both physically and spiritually. He said the reason we have a, a, a what was the word I used? A decline of holiness in this generation is not because we did not protest. Rather, it's because it's because they only protested and did nothing else. That's called that. This is you scream, so you shout, you make conventions, so you scream at people. And then what did you do? What step did you take to actually help anybody? You made noise? You made them feel bad? Great. Oh, uh, now what? What did you accomplish? Very good. Rav Kook then goes on to explain that when you're on a journey, don't scream and don't shout and don't kick. You have to look for the light inside of every person. And show the person you are really good. You really, what you're doing now is a mistake. If you would understand how holy you are, you wouldn't do this. That's the attitude of screaming, protesting. So the reason we're in this state is because we scream and protest. It's not because we don't scream and protest enough. That's called that. That. This is our parents. Betfilan, the prayer b'verkat hashivenu, in the blessing of hashivenu, which I just read. Anachu chotmim baruch ata Hashem ha'otzeb teshuvah. Blessed are you, Hashem, who desires our teshuvah. As I have to explain to you, biuron ta'amo umam namdenu. It's explanation, it's reason, and what is it coming to teach us? 
What I'm going to read to you now from the Gemara is a little bit difficult. What do I mean? Sometimes our Chachamim use interesting language when they talk about Hashem. And we always say this is all just a metaphor, it is not to be meant to be taken literally, but they sometimes bring up more questions than they answer. So I'm asking you, look at the answers to the questions and not the questions they bring up. Amruch Chazan al Menashe Melech Yehuda. There was a king named Menashe, the king of Yehuda. He was a son of Chizkiyahu Melech. Chizkiyahu was very good. Chizkiyahu was the most righteous king that we have, perhaps. David Melech Israel, Chizkiyahu. They say in the days of Chizkiyahu Melech, every little boy and girl in the street, you needed a question in Halakha, you can ask them and they can give you the answer. He was responsible for single-handedly filling the Jewish kingdom with knowledge of Hashem. There's even an old piyut. They made Chizkiyahu Melech Nechzafti. I yearned for the days of Chizkiyahu Melech. It was a special time. Chizkiyahu HaMelech had a son who was the exact opposite of him. Chizkiyahu didn't want to have children. He didn't want. To, he knew. He knew that he was going to have a child, and this child is going to destroy the world. So he didn't want to. And what happened? Yeshayahu HaMelech comes to him and says, "You have to have a child. You can't get involved in in matters of Shemayim. You do what you need to do. Hashem will do what He has to do." The Torah in Menachim tells us about. I'm going to read you from Menachim. What? What? Who is Menashe? Vayas hara bene Adonai. He did all that was evil in the eyes of Hashem, hagoyim, even the abominations that he brought from the non-Jews. And he was involved in sacrificing his children in the fire and all, all these terrible uh, dead spirits and everything else that was involved. And he was involved again in bringing back the dead and speaking to spirits and all kinds of the evil things. He did many things to make Hashem mad, this is what he was just wanted to spite HaKadosh Baruch He did more mikol asher asu ha'emori asher lefanav. He managed to outdo the Amorites who were in Israel before him. V'yechti gam et Yerushalayim. He also made Yerushalayim sin. Livad mechatot, livad avnur mechatot asher echti et Yehuda v'asot ha'ra b'nei Adonai. This is aside from all the sins that he caused the people of Yehuda to do as well. He was like a mass, a serial uh, rasha. Everything he could do, he was getting his hands on. Amari Yehuda, Amari Bitzchak, Mishum Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. In the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, this is Sanhedrin on page 103a. My dichtiv, what does it say? Vayishma elav, vayachtor lo, vayater lo mibayleim. It says that Hashem heard him and he dug for him uh, an entrance to tshuva. Dug for him. He should have heard his tshuva. It's as if Hashem made for Menashe a tunnel in the heavens. In order to accept him in tshuva. Why did he make the tunnel? Because of the Midat Adin. says Rashi, Midat Adin ayta ma'akevet. Midat Adin, the, the character trait of judgment, didn't allow. Shalol lekabel p'nei Menasheh b'tshuma. He said, how can you accept Menasheh? How can you accept him in bed? How does Hashem want this man? V'asa ha-kadosh b'chuh makhteret barakia. Hashem made this tunnel, so to speak, in Shemaim. U'pashat yado v'kiblo b'lo yidiyat Midat Adin. And he opened his hands and he accepted Yoshua with open arms. Uh, Menashe with open arms and didn't let the Midat Adin so that he kind of tricked the, the Midat Adin the, the character of judgment the attribute of judgment I'm going to put now aside this duality of Hashem versus another force there is no other force aside from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. simply understand that there was an aspect of Hashem that said hey this is not just this is not the way this should work a person who spends his whole life Ah, ben Hashem, he made people do sins. This is not the person you're supposed to bring back with open arms. Especially, don't go out of your way to bring him back. Hashem made a special tunnel for him. We actually use this wording in the Sidur. If you ever look, maybe we have it here. Yeah, here, look. We have um, a Yihirat Zon that you could add in for any person. that We do it for ourselves, for sure. But else, if you want to add anyone else that you think needs a, a blessing for Tshuva, we say, Yihirat Zon may be your will. Shetachtor chatira mitachat giseh vodecha. That you should create a tunnel beneath, beneath your throne of glory to bring back the Chol Poshe Israel, all those deliberate sinners of the Jewish people. 
and then you can add in a name. Bring me back and my name. Because your hand is extended to receive people who are returning. Page 105. So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes out of his way to bring back even Menashe. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem says, that I want to outdo the Midat Adin, and I want to bring Menashe back. Chazal tell us, This is from Psachim on page 119b. Hashem's hand, Pusa Tachat Kanfe Achayot, is under the wings of these angels called Chayot. In order again to accept Balei Teshuvah, that the Midat Adin, the attribute of judgment, would not let. Says Rashi again over there, Mipne Midat Adin, Shemeket Regat, Vomeret, Lo Tekablen. The Midat Adin says, Don't accept this person. You know, I can tell you all the bad things this person did. Hashem says, "Who mekablem besete? Mekablem besete? He accepts them in uh, seter, in, uh, in secret. He, he hides them. And he brings them back to tshuva." The Talmud Yerushalmi says in Masechet, the second chapter of Masechet Makot, the sixth halacha there. Shalu lechokma chote mahu onsho. They asked wisdom, chokma, wisdom. What should you do with a person who is a sinner? And it answered, again, you shouldn't accept them. Shalul and Vuah, they asked the prophecy. What should he do? He said, you should kill those who are sinners. Shalul the Kucha Brichu, they came to ask Hashem. What should you, what's the punishment of a sinner? Amar lehem, yase tshuva v'itkaper. You should do tshuva, and I'll forgive him. It can't smile, these tears like t- uh, for Yom Kippur. We should just think about this all day. Hainu Dichtiv, that's what it says. Tov Yashar Adonai, and Ken Yurech Chataim Badech. We are good, Hashem is good and straight, and therefore He guides sinners on the path of Tshuva. Yurech Lechataim, Derech Lato Tshuva. Hashem helps those people who are Yurech Lechotim, could be a way to do Tshuva. The Pnei Moshe. There's a commentary here in the uh, Talmud Yerushalmi. He said that according to wisdom, what does it mean he asked wisdom, what should he do with the sinner? If you were thinking logically, does it make sense that a person who spends his whole life doing something bad can in a few words, in a few actions, with a few tears, erase everything in his past? Does it make sense that logical? It's happened before. Sure, it's happened. But imagine here, imagine if a person uh, did some terrible crime. And then they come to court and they cry a little bit and they do vidui, they confess, that, you know, I did it wrong, I plead guilty. Imagine, is it working? Storage almost full. That, that's okay, you can press done. Or, it's, it's okay. Yeah. So, when a person, when a person comes to the judge, I plead not guilty. The judge, okay, fine, go home. What? Go home. Now we just start to begin about consequences. How many years of prison, what kind of prison, maximum security, minimum security, how many visitation rights, solitary confinement, death row, and all kinds of things they talk about. This is after a person does tshuva. The world doesn't believe in tshuva. But Hashem believes in tshuva. Not the criminal justice system, no. Hashem believes in tshuva. Bochen Kleot Valev, perhaps Hashem has something that the judge doesn't have. Hashem is able to look into a person's heart and to see if they're putting on a show because their lawyer told them it will look good or because they really mean it. If they really mean it, the Baruch says, I'll take you back. You can't trick Hashem with tshuva. You can trick a judge. You can't trick Hashem. So if you do real tshuva, Hashem can bring you back. A judge doesn't know if he's being tricked or not. But does that mean that you're absolved of all your sins or you really have to? Uh, I mean, you still have to... There are varying degrees of tshuva. So a person could do a little bit of tshuva, a full tshuva. A person could spend their lifetime trying to take back the effects of what they did beforehand. But I'm not sticking my head now in... in Hashem accepted them back. Hashem wanted them back. That's an incredible concept. I'll spend my whole life fighting Hashem actively, and Hashem still wants me back.
So what does Hashem have to do? It's the way that's prophecy. Prophecy says, you know, also in the spiritual realm, it doesn't make sense that a person can damage so much. The Mukubalim tell us when a person does something wrong, it's sometimes worse than destroying the whole Bet HaMikdash. A person does something right, it could even be better than building the Bet HaMikdash. So the prophecy says, how could it be that a person will spend their whole life destroying Bet HaMikdash, and they're going to come, Hashem wants Am Yisrael to do Shabbat. Hashem wants, He wants us back. And therefore, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I have inside of me, so to speak, Tov V'yashav. I have good and straight. Those are two seemingly, remember we've discussed in the past about Tov Yashav. Remember this? Vasita Yashav Atov, Vasita Tov Yashav, we gave a class about prison systems in Judaism. The side of Hashem that is Tov, that is good, Kiteva HaTov Lehetiv, says the Ramchal, Moshe Ram Zato, that the nature of one who is good is to do good to other people. That part of Hashem always wants Am Yisrael to come back. The part that is Yashav, straight, just, so hey, there has to be justice in the world. It can't be this guy spends his whole life from when he's born learning Torah, praying, trying to do tshuva every single day, being good. And this one spends his whole life, 60 years partying in the streets. All of a sudden he comes back and they both can sit next to each other in the Bet Knesset of the Yom Kippur. Doesn't make sense. He says, Hashem, it does make sense. It does make sense. Hashem gives permission on Yom Kippur. You have permission to pray with the sinners. You have this permission. And people can come back. Yesh kone olamo b'shayachat. The rabbi says there's a person who can acquire his whole world to come in one minute, in one moment. Judging is not for us. There's a story Rabbi Shlomo Kavach once shared. If I don't get all the details right, don't hold it against me. It's been a long time since I heard it. There's a famous Hasidic rabbi called the Bach, the Beit Chadash. That wasn't his really name. His name was a book. His name was. I don't know the Bach's name. Rabbi Yoel Circus. I bring him in my book in the last chapter I brought him down. The Bach is a commentary on the tour of Shulchan Aruch. There's the Beit Yosef, Rabbi Sakara, and the Bach. The Bach also happens to be the great, 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 great grandfather of Rabbi Shlomo Kavach. Mm. He was a big tzaddik, a big mikubal. And I believe there's a story of him that one of his students became a pope somewhere. It was a left Judaism, uses kochota his holy powers for terrible things. I don't remember the whole story. Chacham of Yosef brings that story down in Perkevot, in, in his book, Anap and Tzavot. This story, though, I heard from Rosh Hashanah Kabach. The Bach once had a vision that he was going to be buried next to some man from a neighboring village, and this was going to be the person who was going to be buried next to him. They buried next to that tzaddik. There's a demand. The Chachamim tell us that a tzaddik and a rasha are not allowed to be buried next to each other. You have to have tzaddikim, buried with tzaddikim. Evil people are buried with evil people. They cannot have everyone mixed together. So when a person like the Bach, who's the greatest tzaddik in the generation, he sees he's going to be buried next to somebody, so he wants to know what is he, what happened that this person merited to be buried next to me. So he decided to go to the next village to ask about Rabbi Chaim the butcher. And he wanted to know who he was. He came, the butcher, so it must be that he's one of these hidden tzaddikim. So he asked the butcher, maybe you guys can stay with you for the weekend, I'm here visiting, I'll pray with you, I'll eat with you, I'll sit with the guys, sure, come to my house. He stayed in his house, and he sees, he prays, he doesn't even know really how to read the Siddur. It's by the dinner table, he makes Kiddush with a few mistakes, he doesn't make a very good Kiddush. There's nothing special here about this person, he's with him, he's maybe at midnight he wakes up to pray, to Chatzot, he didn't hear anything at midnight. The whole Shabbat is watching him, and he doesn't understand for the life of him what is going on here. Sunday, there was a wedding for his son. His son was engaged for many months to be married to a certain girl from another village. And he invited the Bach said, anyways, you're with me, why don't you come to the wedding? He said, I've spent all my savings that I made for it. It's my, my one son. I want him to get married, to be happy. And they come to the wedding, and the Bach is just there among the guests. Nobody knows who he is. The Bach is watching over these beautiful, there's, I don't know, a shmor, I don't know what they do with the, the weddings back then, I didn't have no idea. It came time for the chuppah, and as the groom is walking down to the chuppah with his father, they hear a man crying. And the father says, you're at my wedding, you should smile, be happy, why are you crying? And he says, you know, I was supposed to marry this girl. She's the love of my life. I always wanted to marry her. But right before our wedding, I wasn't able, the dowry fell apart, the finances fell apart. He says, and I'm not, uh, I wasn't able to marry her, we broke off the shidduch. 
And so now I was, I'm, I'm single and she's engaged to marry your son and my heart is broken that I'm not able to marry her. And at that moment, Rav Chaim the butcher, he told his son, took him aside, said, let's talk about this. He said, this might be his spiritual partner. He said, and because of money, we're not going to let it happen. He spoke to his son. His son took off his suit. He gave it to this man. And they made a wedding for this man. And uh, Rav Chaim's son didn't get married that day. And Chaim the butcher paid for the whole wedding. He danced the wedding as if it was his son getting married. They ended up getting married. And the Bach came home and his wife said, No, so who are you going to be buried next to? He said, I'll tell you, when I went to this town, I said, Who is this Chaim that has the merit to be buried next to me? He said, But I left that town saying, Who is Yoel Circus that can be buried next to this butcher? Sometimes you have to know there's different people, different. there's a world of tshuva, there's hakadosh b'chu, there's tov, there's yashar, there's goodness in the world. The story about the Bach, you never know. You never know what a person can do. You see him, he looks so simple. You don't know what they did in their life to merit the schuyot that they did. You don't, they have no idea. Sometimes there are people that you think, you look at them, you, you judge them, you don't know. Only a kadosh b'chu can look into a person in Shaman and say, oh, this one is going to go to get and that one's going to have to wait. Why? Hashem. Hashem's calculations are not ours. But we trust Akadosh Baruch that He's thinking the right things for us. And therefore, a parent says, if you want to understand something else, a rabbi saying, Masechet Psachim, Shiva Dvarim Nivra'u Kodem Shnivra Haonan. There were seven things that were created before the world was created. Seven things created before the world was created. You have to understand with me, don't read this like a child. What does it mean when the Torah tells us that things were created before the world was created? If there was nothing in the world, so how were they created before the world was created? How do you understand that on a spiritual level? Prepare. Preparation. There's a preparation. Why does this? Pre- why does it have to happen? Why couldn't Hashem create it after the world? What does it make a difference that it was created before the world was created? Oh, I don't know. Things that were created, these forces, they must have been very important. They needed to be there before the world, so maybe there is more important than the world, and they, these needed are ingredients that needed to be there for us to be created. And if the world exists, very good. That's a nice I would say he was getting his tools prepared to construct something, to make something. Look, you're before saying it. similar things along the line here. What if I told you the following? Like the carpenter gets out his tools to create a table or a piece of furniture. He gets ready to do it. How Pellets saw this in a different way? Once the world is created, there's a nature that exists in the world. There's an order to the world. And once there's order to the world, it is very rare for Hashem to disrupt the order of the world. Uh, splitting of the seed doesn't happen every day. Hashem had to create certain things, so to speak, before the world. What does that mean? These are exceptions to the rules of logic that exist in the world. One of those things that Gemara says is tshuva. Meaning, according to the nature of the world, it doesn't make sense that somebody could do tshuva. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You could do something wrong your whole life and Hashem can accept you back just like that. Sure, it takes work. I'm not taking away the work of tshuva. Without we're studying from Rav Soloveitchik. But this concept that Hashem even wants you back. Sometimes, let's imagine a couple. These guys, that you can never do anything bad enough to me that I won't want you anymore. Someone might say it, but who can live up to it? And imagine that, okay, what's the worst someone can actually do to their partner? Imagine here, this person burns down their husband's house, they break his cars, they, they hurt his children, should I still want you back? We don't do the same thing. We don't destroy Hashem's world. We don't hurt Hashem's children. We don't, we don't do that. You never were mean to somebody in the last month of your life. And Hashem still wants us back. That is where we say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Arotzeh B'Tshumah, you still want me. That feeling of being wanted, that feeling of being, I have a home, I have a place to call my own, it's a very special thing. I got a message this week in the, my email. There was a guy who came through here. And it turns out, I didn't know this, but his father is a big Rosh Hashivan Yerushalayim. I only met him as a Jewish guy with a non-Jewish girlfriend. And we invited him to our house a few times for Shabbat. And I don't know that he's staying in San Diego, but he's been involved in our community a little bit. And he wrote to me that this, he, even if he moves out of San Diego, he's still going to come back and visit here. This is the only place that he felt that he could belong to. When I hear something like that that tells me 
I don't know what his story is. I don't know what his journey is. I don't know where he's going. But I know that you gave a person this feeling that we want you. And when a person feels they're wanted, the decisions they make are very different. They say, Aaron, you have to be from the students of Aaron. Ohev shalom, Odev shalom. He loved peace, he pursued peace. Ohev the Beriot, he loved people in the Karavan of Torah, and he brought them close to the Torah. Aaron, the way he brought people close to the Torah, do you know what he used to do? He didn't speak to them about keeping Torah mitzvot. He would become their friends. And the person would feel this feeling, like, you know, if Aaron Akwain feels that I'm his friend, if he would only know the things that I do when he's not hanging around my house, I have to shape up, I have to get my act together. When a person feels they belong somewhere, they have this opportunity to, well, if, if only the people at Shul knew what it is that I do between Shabbat and Shabbat. So they inevitably change themselves. They inevitably become better because nobody wants to live a double life. And that's the hope. When you give, HaKadosh was telling me, I want you. And when you hear Hashem wants me so much, so why am I spending my whole life fighting him? If someone, Hashem, he hates you. Hashem, he thinks you're a, you're a, I don't know, you're a terrible person. Hashem, he doesn't even count you for a minyan, Hashem. You hear things like that, it doesn't make me want to run back into Hashem's arms. That's the God I want to run to. <laughs> Please, I know why I left. When that HaKadosh Baruch Hu which will make a blessing every single day with Hashem's name, He wants you. He wants you. That can change a whole person's life. And with that, I want to end off with a letter. I may have read it, part of it to you, a long time ago. But I, I don't think I've ever read it and translated it into English for the people here. This letter came across my table by accident. <laughs> Clearly it's not an accident. But this letter changed the way that I feel about many things. He's writing a letter to a certain Rabbi Avraham. I don't want to mention his last name, so I won't be the this is Rabbi Yosef Masas. These books, I've been looking for them since the middle of 2000, like 2006, 7 I've been looking for these books. 2008, when I went to Israel, that's when I really started my search. Wherever I went in Israel, even to the guy who printed them, I could not find these letters. He didn't have any more. I eventually get in touch with some people. Maybe I'll buy a used one. I couldn't. So I would go. I have my father's brother is a big rabbi in Haifa, in Kirat Adha. He's a high-ranking officer in the Israeli army and he's also a, a rabbi of the community and he had a set of these books I would sit every Shabbat at his house and I would just devour these books and then you know, I was uh, shopping around when I was in New York my wife was in college last not this summer the summer before in New York and I was looking for these books for a long time and I went to some books that there they deal with rare books uh, some people that deal with out-of-print books nobody had them I had a PDF version of the books, but I didn't want to print them. It's a lot of paper to print three volumes of books, and I don't know copyrights and the stories and how that works. I went to a Sephardic bookstore that sells all kinds of special Sephardic books that nobody else sells. Nobody had these books. So I finally found myself in Muncie, in a bookstore, that when I came inside the bookstore, I was very upset. I asked if they have any Sephardic books. That's my first time. I want to see the section. It's a huge bookstore. I don't have any Sephardic books. I said, come on, it can't be a bookstore in 2016 and not have one Sephardic book. Because maybe I have a Benish Chai for you. So I told my wife to pick me up in an hour. I'm going to do an hour in a bookstore. <laughs> now, it doesn't have Sephardic books, it's okay. I buy also books that are not Sephardic. But if a person doesn't sell a variety of books, chances are nothing in the store is going to match what I'm looking for. And then, you know, I'm going to look around. I'm stuck here for an hour anyways. I had El Khanan with me. So I'm walking around the bookstore, and I'm, I'm like, I'm done. I, you know, I, how many, how many mass-produced books can you buy? They're nothing special. Not even Hasidic books. Not, nothing special. I was about to just walk out and go to, I don't know, there's a Judaica store next door. Just look at candlesticks. I'm going to look at it. There's nothing here to look at. And al Khanan dropped his bottle. And so I reached down to pick up his bottle. And on the bottom shelf, this could be a story from a movie, the bottom shelf, Three volumes of Rabbi Masai's letters, laying dusty. They were ripped like they are right now. They were just laying there in the in the pile. The books I've been looking for for years and years. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought, like, okay, maybe I'm hungry, maybe I'm tired. Maybe I took the books. I ran to the counter. I said, I said are these books for sale? I said they don't have price on them. He said, yeah, they're for sale. I said, how much? He told me like sixty dollars. I told him, you know, you could sell these books to me for a hundred thousand dollars right now, and I, I would pay for it. Where well, I get hundred thousand dollars, I wouldn't pay hundred thousand dollars. But I, it's how much they're worth. He tells me, you know, they've been sitting there for twenty years in the bottom shelf really? over there. He said all they do is collect dust. I would be happy if you got rid of them for me. 
You know, sometimes I look at the bottom shelves and books. Oh, so I should look at the bottom. So I got this books. This book, twenty years they were sitting there clearly waiting for me to show up. But I'll come out to the book. Store. You have to always believe in Hashem. God put you. Hashem always puts you in the right place, at the right time. So this letter told, tells us the following story. I received your letter. I read it. Says, I've, I've, your letter is full of all kinds of scary ideas. and talks about all kinds of punishments. They're new. So they're invented punishments towards people who do things that are not good. Says, you should know this attitude of scaring people to do tshuva. Not only will it not bring in its wake any good, not any physical good, not any spiritual good. To the contrary, scaring people, tasim, it'll make a worry in all of a person's limbs. And it will make an intense pressure in their heart. It will confuse their brain. And you could drive a person to insanity with these ideas that you're teaching them. And he'll cause damage to himself and to other people. That happened to many other people who've been trapped already in this field. I'm going to walk almost naively amongst my people in my house. And he explains, this man was writing a book. He's living in a time where in Israel Jews were running right and left from Judaism. And he decides he's going to write a book to scare the living daylights out of everybody so they'll all become observant Jews. That was his plan. There are many today that think this is still the right path to bring people close. And he gives them a whole speech how you should live amongst everybody and you should be nice to everybody. These are simple things that I don't. nobody should have to write in a letter. But then he says, shalom, Say hello to everybody first. And you should accept everybody with a smiling face. Like they wrote about Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, that he accepted everybody with a smiling face. The Gemara in Brachot says that not even a non-Jew in the street was able to say hello to him before he said hello to them. Said so in the people that were non-Jews in their generation, it wasn't like today. They were all pagans, all devout idol worshippers. Because Hashem demands from us before we're religious to be humans, He said to them, Hello first. So how much more so to a Jew, your brother? It doesn't make a difference who he is. Dati or chiloni, religious or non-religious. And if you see a Jew that does one mitzvah, you should be so proud of him. Be happy with him. Even if he does one mitzvah. So he drives on Shabbat. But he came to shul. That's a mitzvah. Be happy with him. You're not happy that he's breaking Shabbat. You're happy that he comes to the Bet Knesset. But only a fool would say that we're happy that people drive. We're not happy that people drive. It hurts us very much and our neshama hurts us. But we're happy that if they're driving, they're coming here. It's not a, shem, not a package deal. It's been thousands of years. We've been in this cruel galut. A bitter galut. We are so tied up in the non-Jewish world, whether it's our business, whether it's our education, whether it's our, just our lifestyle. This is how many of us study only in their schools? And every baby, boy and girl, when they begin to talk, they speak their language. And we have no weapon that we can fight against this invasion of our culture. We don't have weapons to fight this, this faith. It's all left up to our emuna. But he says something crazy here. Our emuna does not have the tools to fight this tide. You cannot drag anybody to our faith through emunah. 
ונתגדל על דרכי התורה והמצוות, that if a person was raised in תורה ומצוות, שאם ישגע אותה מאורו ומראהו, he says sometimes he'll see a pasuk, he'll see something, and he'll see a pasuk, 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 they strayed for 30 years and some pasuk hits them in the face. They see an article in the newspaper and I want to come back home. In a video that we made in the singing class, the Achot Ketana video, how many messages I've gotten from people because of that? It's so funny. A song that people remember growing up did more for them than any class we ever put anywhere. Hmm. This person, you know, that's reminding me of I haven't been in the synagogue in 10 years. I, there's a whole, it's a long letter. I can't read you the whole letter in the interest of time. He says, you see a person, pray for him that he'll be able to do tshuva. He says, even people who were born to tzaddikim, to chassidim, you find that one generation later, two generations later, they're... We had a person in our class, they, they brought us a book that grandfather wrote. Chidushim in the Talmud, and the Rambam. What happens to a whole generation of people? What happened to the whole family tree? It doesn't help. There's no promise. There's no guarantee. Vim reiter to aver avera. And if you see a person who's doing averot, tiye mashiye, whatever it is, al tisneu, al taznicheu. Don't hate him. Chazav shalom. Ki tzarich ladat sheteva haadam balchon rachu. This is a person. This is their their nature. Their nature is this way. And if you see that after all this, they're still doing one mitzvah, this is a huge wonder that he can still do a mitzvah in this world. You can have a Jew in San Diego in America who grew up in a public school who his whole life was raised by parents who never took him to a because and he shows up sometimes, even if it's just for young people. You should be so proud of him. You should be so happy. You should grab him and dance with him. ובכן, and therefore he ends off his letter. מחויבים מאוד ללמד זכות על ישראל בכל דבר ודבר. We have to judge the Jewish people favorably in everything. ומי שאינו מלמד זכות, and anyone who doesn't judge the Jewish people favorably, but he always talks about how bad the Jewish people are, עונשו חמור מאוד מאוד. His sin is greater than he can bear. And he says, how much more so inside of a person's house? You see your children are not doing what they should be doing, your spouse, he has a... Then this is his last point that he wanted to make was, well, what about all those books of Kabbalah? That talk about all the punishments that will happen to people, that talk about all the Gehenoms they're going to go to. What about those books? They're written, they're part of our tradition. If he didn't say this, if there wasn't a tzaddik greater than I who said this, I would say it's forbidden to say this. So let's see what he says. Vizaher ma'od medimyonot kozvod. Be very careful from these and crooked imaginations, uh, visions. Even if you find them written down in some books, some holy books, the authors of those books also had wild imaginations. Hashem Hashem should protect you from these books, from you. Vishmarenu, they should protect us also from people like you. Amen. He ends off his letter. With a lot of respect, Eved Hashem, a servant of Hashem, Yosef Masaz. He ends off his letter. The imaginations, it's not our problem that people have wild imaginations. Are they written? Of course. After Kabbalah? Of course. But that's not the way it's going to work in this generation. You're not going to scare somebody to come back to Kedosh Baruch If you grab all the Jews in the street, you tell them, Hashem wants you. Hashem made an exception. You can break everything in the Torah. Hashem still wants you. It's never too late for you to come back. To speak to them in this kind of language, everybody will want to come home. Everybody will want to have something else. Nobody wants to come somewhere to feel bad that they came. And nobody wants to come, you should know, it's a mistake. Nobody wants to come and think that you approve of everything they do. How many people come here and think that we, everything they do we accept? Of course they know that we don't. But they're happy that even though they do the things they do, if Hashem wants them, how can I not want them? If Hashem wants them, who am I to tell them, get out of here, you don't belong here? It doesn't work that way. And Kadosh Baruch Hu, His love is much greater than everything else. Hashem created an exception to the world. Before the world was created, that tshuva would always be an option for another person. 
to the point where the Zohar says there are certain avirot that a person can never do tshuva for. And says Rabbi Nachman of that he has another understanding of the Zohar. Of course a person can do tshuva. But the Zohar says you can't do tshuva. He so says, I can't believe in my life that there's an avirah in the world that a person can do, but Hashem won't accept him back. There's no such thing. To tell the Jewish people this message, you are not lost, you are not forgotten, nobody's sitting shiva over you, nobody is upset at you. Come back home, come back, come back, come back, come back. This is the only message we can speak to Amisad. This is the message that will bring the Jewish people back home. Make that blessing with one of Kavanah because it's including us. Make for me a tunnel under the divine throne. Because you want me to come home and to do tshuva. Give the Jewish people a sense that they belong. And last but not least, Al Uziel. Al Uziel changed my perspective on these Maccabea games. They have these games they do. People go to Israel, they go to South America. Oh, so you know, you take the name Maccabee. Maccabee were the people who fought against the Greeks interfering with Jewish tradition. So to take the name of the people who were against assimilation and use it to assimilate is in an Olympic setting fashion, which I mean, the Olympics started by the Greeks. The Greeks were who the Maccabees were fighting. It's almost, if it's not mocking the Maccabees, it's, a, it's at best ignorance of who were the Maccabees. I used to mock these things very much. And then once I read a speech, there's a book called, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Michmane Uziel. Michmane. Yeah, Michmane Uziel. This book is, it's like a nine volume series of Uziel speeches. And I saw his speech that he gave in the early 50s at the opening games of the Maccabiyah that were happening on Shabbat. And Rav Uziel said, you should know, if you would ask me, I would beg you not to do this on Shabbat. He said, but you're not asking me. He said, and I want to tell you, those people who say that Hashem doesn't want you here, they're wrong. Hashem wants you here. He said, sometimes parents come to visit, uh, children come to visit their parents, and they don't do everything the way their parents want them. They don't listen to their parents. But which parent would tell their kid, I'd rather you not visit me? He said, only a cruel parent would say such a thing. He said, I promise you that Hashem wants you here. And Hashem wants to see all of you here. And if you would be here and also keep Shabbat, how much more Hashem would be happy. He said, but even if you don't, nobody should tell you that Hashem doesn't want you here. Because Hashem wants you here. Hashem is always happy when His children come home. This attitude of unconditional love towards Am Yisrael, if we show it to other people, I promise you Hashem will show it to us also. Mida connect mida. The way we treat others, Hashem treats us. And if the whole time we're like, you can't do tshuva, Hashem doesn't care about you, you're a bad person, that's the way Hashem will speak to us also. And if we follow this track, I would say tshuva, the education we received from our rabbis, from the Tamil Chamim of the previous generation, Hashem will say the same thing to us. Yom Kippurim, He'll say, Baruch Hashem, I would say tshuva, I want your tshuva. And we'll hear the words of Salachti Kitvarecha. I've forgiven you as you have spoken. This is the prayer that he comes.